us this morning. Amen. And we want to pray for those we don't see. Amen. And, and we definitely want to just take an account that prayer, it does change things. Amen. We pray with expectation. We pray frequently. But when we do pray, we must pray for our Father's will, amen, and for the ability to deal with whatever is in that will. So we are praying for our little one and for those, amen, that we do not see. Amen. Let us do our declaration, amen, before we get started, amen. This is my Bible. I must be obedient to all herein, for then I shall richly enjoy every promise it makes, in Jesus' name, amen. To God be the glory on this morning, we do honor God in his presence on this morning, amen. We do honor First Lady and say to her happy birthday amen i'm not going to give up her age amen but today is her birthday amen I, I can just say she still is able to call me old man i am still older than her amen but this is her day and a day that the lord has made so we do honor her as well amen the officers and members of this ministry and to those who join us social for via social media god bless you we thank you also for being with us on this morning, amen, missed you last week, amen, and to those of our membership that are not here on this morning, we are praying with them as well, amen, if you have your Bibles this morning, we will be in James, James, the brother of the Lord, we will read in your hearing chapter 4, verses 7 and 8, amen very familiar text. Let me get my peepers here. Amen. It's on the screens here and uh, before you at home. And if you're there, you have these words before you. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Amen. May God add a blessing to the reading here and more over the doers of his word. On this morning, if I could just speak to you from a thought, it would be, God is not going to take anything you decide to keep. I wish to give that to you just one more time. God is not going to take anything you decide to keep. Have you ever been in a time where you find yourself reasoning with God and you say, God, I'm tired of doing this. I'm tired of doing that. God, I just need you to take this from me. I need you to take and kill the desire for it. I, I, I just need you to release me from it. And, 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 and we come to church and we're taught if you want to stop doing something, if you want something to change for you, then ask God and he'll take it from you. Be serious with God and he will grant you the ability to take something from you. But I, I just stopped by this morning to cause you to understand. We, we have allowed ourselves to be fooled in this frame of thinking. I, I want you to think about this. Why would God take something from you that you are holding on to? If, if I ask God to... Take this towel from me. And if I become in a tug of war with God having this towel, 
what use would it be for me to ask God to take it from me? We must understand that 10 out of 10 things that we ask God to take from us, we are not ready to release. In fact, what we moreover must understand is the only reason that we ask God to take it from us is because it gives us a in our back pocket excuse to hold on to it. I'm going to help you. What are you, te- what are you telling me, preacher? Well, it is the very reason why we make certain statements. Well, I know I should stop doing X, Y, Z, but God ain't delivered me yet from that. God is still working on me in that area. I've asked God to take it from me, but he is still working with it. But at the end of the day, let me help you, dear hearts. God is not working with you. God is not working on you. You are just now putting your in deficiency upon God because you refuse to stop doing it. You don't want to stop doing it. And rather than to be honest with God and say, God, this is where I am and this is what I'm doing, you say, God, take it from me and thereby, if I keep doing it because you haven't taken it from me, then apparently you're okay with me doing it. Oh, I'm just here to bless somebody this morning. We have it sometimes in our finite mind that God has somehow become okay with what we're doing because he hasn't taken it. But let me help you, dear heart. God gave us free will for a reason. He said, choose you this day whom you'll serve. Either you'll serve God or you'll serve God the gods of your fathers. And and see, sometimes we get it twisted in our mind exactly about what that means. And then furthermore, God says, thou shalt not have no other gods before me. But yet, there are so many things that we put before God. There are so many people we put before God. There are so many things we put before God, and yet, We ask God to bless us in those endeavors that we have placed before him. God, I need a new job. And God is saying, well, it's your job that prevents you from coming to me in the first place. You are more reliant upon your job than you are in me. You will go to your job quicker than you will to me. You want me to give you more of what has become your God, but you don't choose to serve me. But God, you you didn't take this away from me. I asked you to take it, but he is saying choice is ours. You can't choose to do something and then ask God to take it because what you are instinctively asking God to do is something he never elected to do. He never elected to take your free will and force you to do anything. But yet, we want to have it both ways. It is fine for us to be in charge and make our own choices when we're having fun doing it. But then when we take the road towards the consequence for it, all of a sudden, God takes this away. All of a sudden, God, I need you. But we don't need God when we're having fun. We don't need God when things are going well. We don't need God when we feel we got things where we need them. We only need God when the error of our way comes back against us. We only need God when we find ourselves in trouble. We only need God when we want him to snap his fingers and do something quick. We only want God to take something away from us when the consequences of what we're doing have turned against us. But I'm here to tell you this morning 
God won't take your free will. God will not take something that you continue to hold on to. You are only doing some things because you choose to do them. You're still hanging around some people because you choose to hang around them. You're still going to some places because you choose to go there. You're still doing some things because you choose to do it. It would not matter if God took the desire or not. You would still do it because you choose to do it. God is not going to take these things from you because he's not going to get into a tug of war with you over what you're trying to keep. And God is not going to keep allowing you to use him as your scapegoat for continuing to do the things you know you should not do. When the remedy is simple, if the devil is on your track, if the devil is on your trail, it's because you've chose to be in his playground. If the devil is continually oppressing and depressing you, it's because you have chosen to do some things that are not of God. Because he says to us, submit our ways to him. Now, what you need to understand about this word, submit, he's asking you to come online with, align yourself with his way. He's, watch this, God is already greater than you whether you choose to be in submission to him or not. But he is not asking you to come into servitude of his way. He is asking you to become one with him. He's asking you to become one with him as he came through 40 and two generations to be one with you. He's asking you to make some sacrifices in your choices like he made sacrifices in his. He's just asking you to do what's better for you. He's asking you to do something. Watch this. There's some things that we do that we know where the end conclusion is going to wind up at. And yet we do them and then turn around and ask for God to end the circumstance for as soon as it comes. But he says to us simply, come online with my ways. Make my ways your ways. I have walked before you. I have lived before you. I have shown you the way. I have shown you the light. All you have to do is this. Now if you choose to do that, what comes out of that, you've got to deal with. You can't, instead of dealing with it, say God, take it away and then feel that I'm going to make it easy for you to make your choices. He said for you to choose. He said for us to decide what we wanted to do. Do we want to serve God or do we want to serve everything else? But serving everything else has an undue consequence. Serving other things comes back upon you. But then he turns around and says, you have to draw nigh to God. For him to draw nigh to you. You can't be wanting to live in sin. And willingly do sin. And then ask God to come near to you. And just take it from you. God is not going to. Just take and root out your free will. To do what you want to do. And then turn around. And then judge you. God is not going to make you do what he wants you to do. Then turn around and judge you. The reason why we are able to be judged is because we have the choice. And then he says, it's your job to purify your heart. It's your job to not be double-minded. It is your job to see where you are thinking. It is your job to weigh the matters of what you're thinking. It is not God's job to just take it from you. If that was the case, that would make things, oh, thank you, Holy Ghost. I need to tell you about my big brother, Paul. Paul, you know him as Saul from Tarsus. And, and, I, and if I explain it to you right, the word says that he had this thorn in his side. In other words, an issue that he was dealing with. 
And the word says he went to God not once, not twice, but three times asking God to take this thing away from me. God, take this thorn from me. And the word says that God said to him, my grace is sufficient for you. In other words, my instruction is sufficient enough for you to follow and take it out yourself. My wisdom gives you a different choice that you can make. This thorn does not have to be in your side because you are allowing it to be in your side. So why would I take the thorn out your side when you are allowing it to be there? I can't take something away from you that you're holding on to. Let it go. And then you don't have to ask me to take it from you. You just have to let it go. You have to decide that I'm tired of going through this over and over and over again. I'm tired of not being able to call on you in the midnight hour. I'm tired of moaning and groaning and going through the same thing because I keep making the same decisions. I keep doing the same old things and dealing with the same consequences. But if I only grow tired of the pain from the thorn, I can't ask you to take it. If I'm only wanting to get rid of the pain while I allow the thorn to be there, what good does it take? Ask for me to take it. I can't take it and hold on to it at the same time. I can't, as you take it out, take it back from you, stick it back in and say, God, take it again. The word says we're double-minded. And it's may seem out of context for it to be here in this scripture. But if you start it from the first chapter in James, he tells you that a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. This is why sometimes we're up, sometimes we're down, and sometimes level to the ground. I know y'all sanctified folks know that way of talking. And sometimes I feel all right. Sometimes I feel like shouting. Sometimes I feel like crying. Sometimes I feel this. Sometimes I feel that. Sometimes you feel like a nut. Sometimes you don't. You in this place where you're double-minded. One minute you want to serve God. The next minute you don't want to hear nothing about God. The one minute you want to sin. The next minute you don't want to sin. One minute you want to be holy. The next minute, you don't care about holiness. We're in this place where we're in between. We're lukewarm. And the word says we're unstable. The reason why so many of us call on God is because we're unstable. We're unstable because we're double-minded. The word says one thing and we think we can get something else out of it. God says, do this, and we do that. And then we turn around and say, God, why don't I get what the, what the word says I can get? Because I'm doing it. But he's saying, you're still doing what you want to do. You're not doing what I've asked of you. You're not doing what I've required. Because if you were, what I said would happen would happen. I don't tell you to go left two, down, two steps down the street make another right, and you will get to your destination only for you to do that, and the destination is blank. God says, I don't think that way. I don't roll that way. If I tell you to go left, take two steps up and make a right, you're going to end up exactly where I told you. But what happened is somebody told you something different. Somebody told you what God said, make two rights, Go up two steps and make a left, and you'll be where you need to be. It's the same distance, but it's a different direction. But see, we get hooked up in taking on teachers that we want to hear what they say because it sounds good. We want somebody to speak to our emotions. We want somebody to make it make sense to us. We don't want to elevate our mind of thinking. We want somebody to dumb God down for us. 
And thus we heap teachers to us as the word has said to tell us what we want to hear and to make us feel all warm and fuzzy inside. But this morning I don't want to speak to your emotion. I don't want to just give you a new idea this morning. I want to speak to your intellect. I want to speak to the very thing that's getting you in trouble. I want to speak to the very thing that God says you must change to be able to get what he says you can have. It's time out. We have people tell us that God is responsible, that God is going to do it. This is the things we hear. Slap your neighbor, high five, and tell him God's going to do it this weekend. God's going to do it. And we all around the church slapping high five to people. Say, say to your neighbor, something good, something God. Something good, something God. I, I'm expecting, I'm in expectation. Hallelujah. Nothing. You, you hear, I see nothing but good for you. God wants nothing but good for you. Oh, yes, glory. That's what God wants for me. Here's what I need you to understand as I'm getting out your way. This is not what you want for you. You don't want something good. You don't want something, God, because you're not doing something, God. You want God to save you from and spare you from certain death and consequence while you do what you want to do. You don't want God to take the action. Oh, somebody, whew, somebody help go get the Holy Ghost for me. You want God to take the consequence. You don't want him to take the action because the action feels too good to you. You don't want to give up the action because that feels great to you. I, I'll be the first preacher that probably ever say to you, sin feels good. That's why you don't want God to take the sin. You want him to take what comes from the sin. And you only want him to take that when sin has found you out and now left it sting. You only want to deal with the thorn when it's twisted a certain kind of way and making you feel pain in your paw. But you don't want God to take it while it doesn't feel that bad. You don't want God to take it while it's feeling good. So as I close, I'm saying this to you. Every time you decide to do and re-enter, watch this. Just picture this in your mind. Everything that you ask God to take from you, you have done it before. Everything that you suffer from, you have done it before. The only thing you have not truly tried is God's word, his way. Because once you try that, even a little bit, you'll start to see this pattern. God says, I do, I get. God says, I do, I get. But then somebody steps in the middle that says, it, it don't take all that. All you need to do is give him praise for what he's about to do. And then you do all that. And then you wait. God, I'm waiting. I gave you a praise. Where's my blessing? God said, I didn't ask you for no praise. I asked you for obedience. God said, I didn't ask you to make a fool of yourself. I just asked you to do simple things. The things I'm asking you to do, I'm not trying to meddle in your life. I'm not trying to make it hard on you. I'm trying to advise you against the things you keep asking me to get you out of. Think about this as a parent. I'm done. Take this. Think about this as a parent. You tell your children, 
just do this. Just do it. Don't, don't deviate from what I tell you. Just do it exactly as I say it to you. And then watch what will happen. And your child will do everything except for what you ask them to do. And then have the audacity to come back to you and say, well, why are you upset with me? And you say, well, I just asked you to do something simple. And then they say, well, I didn't know you wanted me to do it right now. I didn't know you meant this and you meant that. Well, I don't know. Maybe this is why the word says, no, I get and get an understanding. But we just think we're doing and we expect God to just do the rest. God has already done everything that he needed to do by dying for us. Let me say this to you again. God has done everything he needed to do by dying for us. Everything that we needed to do. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Why do you think he said it is finished? His part was finished right then. And this is where our work began. But you want God to continue his work. You want God to continue to, to make sacrifices. You want God to continue to do what he's asked you to do. He said his work was finished. He said he would be the author and finisher of our faith. He would give us faith. We must work that faith and he will complete it. But this is because we learn to do what he's asking. We do it the way he says it should be done. And the same way with your child. When your child, and, and I heard somebody say this to me earlier in last, uh, late last week, that they didn't believe that God didn't beat on us in chastisement. And I said to them, I said, you don't have to believe it. But here's the point. God does not beat on you in chastisement. Your consequences beat on you. And you blame it on God in chastisement. God's chastisement is simple. It's his wisdom. Daughter, don't do this. Do that. No, God, I, I got this. And then you do that. <laughs> oh, God, no. Oh, nothing. So, 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 as we think about these things, if we're going to do things our way, if we're going to play God in the beginning, play God and get yourself out. But if you're going to do what God asks you to do, then God is bound to what he said he would do. But make no mistake at all about it. God has never said he would do it for you. He said there's work we have to do. Don't be double-minded about that and have somebody make a fool out of you and make you believe that God is just going to poof, just do it, and you, have, you don't have to do a thing. It doesn't work that way. This work is hard. Just like the work you do for your paycheck. You don't find it easy to go to work to get a paycheck. Why do we believe doing things for God is supposed to be easy? And then we just get paid on top of doing easy. No, dear heart, it doesn't work that way. So as I close, and certainly I'm done, God will not take anything you decide to keep. So stop asking him to take it. I'm done. God bless you. I'm Apostle Samson, and I'd like to personally thank you for joining our broadcast this morning. We pray that something said in the broadcast spoke to your spirit. We again thank you, and hopefully next time you can come see us personally. But if not, maybe you can catch us again next week. But until then, may the Lord bless and keep you, and heaven continuously smile upon you. Stay blessed.